Today we celebrate the feast of Saint Bartholomew the Apostle. But who is Bartholomew? Matthew, Mark, and Luke include Bartholomew as one of the twelve disciples of twelve apostles whom Jesus chose. John does not have him on the list, but he has Nathaniel. And the fact that the liturgists have put him, put this gospel as our reading today, in their minds, Bartholomew and Nathaniel are one and the same person. Bartholomew actually means son of Ptolemy. And so that is what they think. Nathaniel was his first name, and he was the son of, Th of Ptolemy. But having said all that, we still know very little about Bartholomew, and we just have two instances of Nathaniel today in today's gospel, and then again after the resurrection we are told six of the apostles or seven of the apostles joined Peter when he says, I am going fishing. And then Jesus fed them with a breakfast on the seashore, and Nathanael from Cana in Galilee was among them. When Jesus gathered the people together and finally chose the twelve that he wanted to be his close disciples, they came. They were curious. They were interested. Nathaniel was the only one who was skeptical. And yet Nathaniel comes from Cana, which is very close to Nazareth in Galilee. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He looks down on them. <clears throat> and yet later on we will find another person who doubts, and that would be Thomas. Unless I can put my finger into the holes that the nails have made and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And yet Jesus calls these. He does not ask for CVs or resumes. He does not ask for letters of reference. He does not give them any way of proceeding or plan of action. He does not even require financial statements for them. He just says, as Philip would say today, come and see. And when Nathaniel does take on Philip's invitation, Jesus says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. What a beautiful, beautiful compliment to anybody. Here is a person in whom there is no guile. If there's anything I'd like on my tombstone, that would be the case. But we all work, have to work very hard on this. In our society, being deceitful, being ambiguous, being telling half-truths seems to be a way of life. And it goes all the way up to presidents and prime ministers and politicians as well. After all, they are chosen from one of us. We choose them, we elect them, and we can't condemn them when they hedge the truth more than once. And therefore to have a person like Bartholomew and Nathaniel, or ba Nathaniel, son of Ptolemy, is very useful and very beautiful for us to have, not only to admire, but also to imitate. Having said that, if you look at the list of all the 12 apostles, we know very little about them. And that shows us something. Without meaning to make little of them or to demean them, their significance lay in the fact that they were going to be the new pillars, the 12 pillars, the 12 foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. They were to replace the 12 tribes, the 12 leaders of Israel that they had before the Messiah came. Now, they were the foundations of our church today. And you know what our foundations are? If they are not very strong and very good, the whole building will come toppling down. And as Mr. Laporte read in that first reading today, they were made of precious jewels, of jasper and of crystal. These were the most important things in her whole structure, and therefore it was important that the 12 apostles should be alike. But were they? They were men just like you and me. But Jesus chose them, and Jesus brought them out to their fore. What was their job? Their job was not, they did not become important because they were chosen by Jesus. They did not become important because Jesus in the 17th chapter of the John's Gospel said, Father, you gave them to me, I have protected them, and I hand them back to you. No, nope. 
They were very important because they had first-hand experience, an encounter with Jesus in his everyday life, and that was all they had to do. They had to go out and share that experience, the experience of a God who so loves us that he sends his Son in flesh, of uh, a word of God which became incarnate, which was supposed to be handed down to others. And there comes the beauty of our call, your call and mine. Like Philip, we have to be inviting other people to come. Come and see. Come and see this man, Jesus. This man who was born, the Son of God, who came into our midst to tell us about the Father. Now, you and I can do that only if we become very intimate with Jesus ourselves. If we take time to be silent and realize that Jesus is talking to us, to get to know him better because I can't hand over to you if what I don't have. If I do not know Jesus intimately, then my work and my life is worthless as far as being a priest, a messenger of God, a person baptized in the name of Jesus. And like Philip, we have to invite other people. Our big problem is that like, like the great apostles, you know, Peter denied the Lord, Judas betrayed him, the other apostles ran away. Our faith is wavering at times. We sometimes go forward, sometimes we stumble, and yet we are called to tell people that Jesus is the Lord. The beauty about it is that we don't have to do much work. The Lord works through us. The Lord uses our weaknesses and our strengths in order to make the kingdom of God known. St. Paul would say, there is a thorn in my flesh which I would like to get rid of, but the Lord said, my grace is enough. So that Paul would realize that it was not his skill, not his education, not his oratory, but God's work being done through him. And therefore, whether we are in a sick bed out in Stephenville, Newfoundland, or out in Grimsby, Ontario, out in Lethbridge, Alberta, or wherever, we can still witness to the Word of God just like Philip and Nathaniel did. That is what the apostles were called to, and that is what we are called to. God bless you all. Let us pray. Let us pray for a courage. Let us pray for integrity in witnessing to the loving kindness of our God. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear us. We pray for our church, for the ordinary people as we call them, who continue to keep this church alive by their devotion and fidelity. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear us. We pray for our soldiers abroad, working for peace in different parts of the world. We pray for their families who grieve their deaths here, and their families who wait anxiously for their return. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those undergoing surgery today, for those who have died during the night, for our caregivers of those suffering from cancer and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other crippling diseases, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our for peace in the world in the troubled spots and for the weak and the voiceless in our society, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our we bring these prayers through our Lord Jesus Christ, the living God who came and dwelt amongst us to teach us about God, God who lives and reigns with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have the wine to offer. Fruit of the wine and work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Yes. Lord God, be pleased to accept these gifts that we offer to you with humble and with contrite hearts. 